Spotlight, lectures and performances on and around Albany State University. All right, guys, uh, today is a very special day. And one of the ways you can tell it's a special day is because I put on my good shoes. Uh, because today we have a wonderful speaker. This is a colleague of mine, her name is Eunice Kofi. Now, Eunice is going to talk to you about a field known as cosmetic chemistry. And if you're not familiar with it, you should be by the time we're finished today. Just gonna give you a couple, a, a small number of the things that she's been able to achieve during her time as a cosmetic chemist. She's instituted the Moving Closer to My Dreams conference, which is a young women's empowerment conference, an annual conference that's, that's held uh, every year. Um, Forbes has named her as one of the 20 youngest power women in Africa. Forbes is the company that does a lot of the financial evaluations for the United States. Uh, 2012 Golden ACE Award in Science and Technology. She is a former Miss Black Florida USA. And during that time, she spent her, spent that time um, during her reign, her platform was preventing childhood obesity and diabetes through education and life transforming habits. And she is listed as one of the 25 women that you need to know in Tallahassee. And I agree with that. So all of you all will get a chance to know her today. So without further ado, Eunice, okay. the floor is yours. Okay. And um, I wanna thank everyone here for having me here. Um, Albany is such a beautiful school, great campus. I wanna thank the administrators for inviting me here to speak to you all today. I'm just so excited to be able to share um, what I do and what I've learned. And hopefully it'll be an encouragement to each and every one of you to um, think outside a little, out of the box when it comes to your careers and opportunities and um, even you know in, a pr in pursuing entrepreneurship as a, a path as a scientist. So um, my name is Eunice Kofi. I am from Tallahassee, Florida. I went to Florida A&M University and I got a degree in chemistry, molecular biology. Um, and I own a company called Nweki. Basically the company um, focuses on developing dermatological products for the ethnic market. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in the presentation. So this is me as a little girl. And this is me now. <laughs> well, not with the long hair. But um, basically growing up, I was often picked on because of my dark skin. I was called all kinds of names, such as African booty scratcher, blackie, girls would pull on my hair. I've even been spit on. And that really took a toll on my self-esteem. It made me feel like I was not beautiful, that I was not good enough. And it was during that time that my father exposed me to science. That was my saving grace. My father would spend countless hours with me developing science projects and basically te teaching me everything that he knew as a scientist himself. And so um, he helped me enter my first science fair and I actually won. And at that moment, I realized that if I was not viewed by my classmates as the prettiest girl in the room, I knew that I could be viewed as the smartest girl in the room. And so from there, I continued on to compete in science fairs um, in uh, middle school and high school. And I went on to college, as I said before, and majored in chemistry, molecular biology. But it was a chance meeting with the professor during my organic lab class that allowed me to open up my eyes to a whole new world, which was cosmetic science. In our lab class, instead of us doing the just regular organic labs, my professor, Mr. Jackson, who had his own cosmetic company, decided to have us create <coughs> relaxers and lotions. And it was, it was at that moment that I became engulfed in cosmetic science and I started working with him and the chairman of my department allowed me to use the research that I was doing with him towards my degree. And during that time, I realized that we each have these cells in our body called melanocytes but for persons of color, our cells are much larger, which releases a much larger amount of melanin, which gives us our skin pigment. So I realized that these cells were in my body for a reason. It did not make me inferior to anyone, but they were divinely placed there. And I started to realize my true beauty, who I really was. And so from that moment, I said, you know what? There's something here that I need to target. Um, I also realized that there weren't enough products out on the market 
for persons of color. And what I mean by persons of color, it includes your Hispanics, African Americans, your Asians, your Middle Easterners. All of those persons are considered persons of color. So I decided to go ahead and start my company, Nueki. And here, I'm sh this is my target market. With my company, I develop products that treat certain skin and hair disorders. And I'll show you a few pictures of um, certain skin and hair disorders that you'll commonly find in persons of color. We have a unique structure and function to our skin. Our skin, because we have much larger um, melanocytes, it releases a lot more melanin, which gives us our deep pigment. Then we also have much larger um, f uh, cells, fiber cells, which basically, you know, gives us the smooth skin that we have. And I'm sure you all have heard black doesn't crack. That's the reason why. <laughs> So let me talk about why this market is so important. The ethnic market by the year 2050 will basically um, be the majority in this country. And so with that, we have a, a, a much stronger spending power. This is how much we spend broken down by Hispanics, African Americans, and Asians on consumer products. Can you imagine? As African Americans, we spend $1.3 trillion on consumer products. So we have a lot of power. And then as you know, we reach 2050 and we start becoming more of the majority, we're going to need a lot of services and products tailored to our needs. And so that is why I established my company, because I see that there's a greater need for um, products specifically tailored towards us. And excuse me here. Now just on beauty products alone, we spend $3.9 billion. Can you imagine, you know, hair weaves, you know, uh, color cosmetics, our makeup, you know, even down to the shaving creams. This is how much we spend. So for the ethnic market, beauty is very important to them. Aesthetic is very important to them. But a lot of companies don't necessarily realize how strong we are. They think that, you know, products are just a one size fits all and they don't take into account the unique structure and function of our skin. So more specifically, this is how much we spend in each category. You have your skincare, you have your hair care and your cosmetics, and of course, being a woman of color, we love to, you know, get the hair weaves and those who are going natural. You, we want that all natural product that'll help us twist our hair. We spend a lot of money on that. Skincare is a very um, small market and, and that's the area that I'm targeting. And there's a reason why that market is so small because there's not enough education and understanding about our skin. Cosmetics, we love co color cosmetics since, the, you know, since, you know, ancient Egypt, people of color have always, you know, found ways to bring life to their, their skin through cosmetics. Skin of color, ethnic skin and hair is so important now that now you're starting to see a lot of research institutions pop up who are doing research on the specific de diseases and conditions that concern us. So you have Hampton University, you have the Skin of Color Society, um, you have also a lot of workshops that are hosted by dermatologists to talk about the needs of the ethnic market. So I'm sure you guys have seen this in biology class. Um, this is the basics of skin ph physiology. So of course, you know, you have your dermis, your epidermis, um, and those are, you know, some very key areas that um, you want to um, take note of, especially as a cosmetic chemist, because your epidermis, that's where we actually see a lot of the um, skin ailments. But as you go further in the dermis, you'll see that with even with hyperpigmentation, those dark marks that you get, you'll see in um, uh, photographs, you can actually see how deep the hyperpigmentation goes. 
Here I talked about melanocytes, and this is what melanocytes look like. Melanocytes are just your basic cells that produce the pigment in, your, in our skin. The pigment which comes from melanin, and melanin basically acts as a natural sunscreen, and I think it's between 15 and 30 um, SPF um, by standard is what um, our melanin um, protects us from. So the process that gives us our skin pigment basically starts off with the protein tyro um, tyrosine. And that's just one of the processes. There's so many different processes to, to melanogenesis, but this is the basic common one that is used in cosmetic science. So basically you're taking your protein tyrosine and you're turning it into eumelanin, which is basically melanin, or you're t turning it into melanin. So your eumelanin, which is your melanin, is what we see amongst us right now in our skin color. And the fine melanin, you commonly see that in Caucasian persons who are very, very fair and have red hair. And you may not be able to see this slide, but I'm gonna talk about um, <clears throat> the differences um, amongst each ethnic group. So comparatively to um, Caucasians, Asians and blacks, our cells are much, much larger. And then we have a much more curvature to, for African Americans, much more curvature to our hair. And that curvature, you know, have, how many of you guys have, you know, experienced dry hair? Okay, and that's the reason why, because the moisture, it takes a lot of, because of that curve, it takes a lot for that moisture to actually, you know, reach the full head strand because of that spiral curl. But for those of, um, uh, who are Caucasian, it's pretty easy to um, moisturize their hair. And so they don't need it as much as, as we do. When you look at, like I said, black doesn't crack, you look at the fibroblast, you know, which basically you know, constructs our skin structure, the larger the cells, the much smoother the skin, the much thicker the skin, and that basically gives us that whole notion of that black doesn't crack. So we don't experience as many wrinkles in our skin. So for persons of color, you know, we tend not to, you know, age very quickly. And, you know, all of these things are great things, but there's some, you know, some interesting things that happens with our skin that can, you know, be a vice, such as, you know, vitiligo or um, hyperpigmentation um, or even keloids. So years ago, there was a dermatologist that created a Fitzpatrick system. Um, basically, this particular system dictates what category you're in when it comes to skin color. And it also dictates the amount of sun protection that you need. Um, and it segments each population because dermatologists needed to be able to, to segment each population. So as you can see here from one to five, Whenever you go into an esthetician's office or a dermatologist's office, they'll rate you according to the Fitzpatrick type. So for me, I'm a five because I'm really, really dark skinned. But for others, they may be a, a three. And so that helps them to dictate um, how they treat you as a patient. And when I mean treat you, meaning um, they'll look for certain things in, their, in your full body exam. Let's say for instance, you know, persons of lighter skin, like a one, they'll tend to want to do a yearly full body exam to check them for skin cancer because they're more, more prone to skin cancer. So let's look at some of the common disorders that you'll see in every ethnic group. So for Hispanics, you'll commonly see melasma, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation, and dispigmentation. Now melasma is a pigmentary disorder and that and I'll show you some pictures of that. Basically a lot of Hispanic women and Asian women experience this through hormonal changes and it's almost like large patches of darker um, pigment all over their face and it looks it's like a veil and so whenever they have any hormonal changes from pregnancy or maybe stress it'll show up. And um, 
that is usually treated by a dermatologist and assisted with the esthetician through chemical peels, using things such as salicylic acid or glycolic acid to actually bring back that even skin tone. For Indians, they deal with vitiligo, leprosy, again, post-inflammatory um, hyperpigmentation, and then keloids. So for countries in the Middle East, you'll see um, a, a persons dealing with leprosy, and that's uh, autoimmune disease, that basically their immune system is turning against them to cause their skin to um, scale. Asians, they deal with non-melanin skin cancer, and again, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. Now with the non-melanin skin cancer, a lot of that's due to using bleaching creams um, that have high concentrations of hydroquinone and other active ingredients. So over a course of time, their skin develops a sensitivity to the sun and they develop skin cancer. For African Americans or persons of African descent, we suffer less from UV damage because we have a much darker pigment. And then again, I said we have larger melanocytes. Well, now, one of the biggest issues that, uh, that I see amongst um, African Americans or pers um, African descent is hyperpigmentation. You know, everywhere I go, that's the first question that I get. Can you treat my dark marks? Do you have something that can give me that clear skin tone? We also deal with keloids. Any of you guys are in a fraternity, get, you get brands? Yep. When you get that brand, it creates a keloid. And how that keloid is created is those extra skin, those ex, uh, your skin overproduces those skin cells and basically causes your skin to um, develop extra skin on top of what you already have. So with um, persons of color, you commonly see vitiligo as well. Vitiligo is basically a deep pigmentation of the skin. So your skin is basically losing pigment. And um, some of the common treatments for that are camouflage. So basically you'll take a, a foundation makeup product to camouflage the areas where you're lightening. Um, there's also UV therapy. Um, there's also laser therapy that they use to slow the process or even reverse the process. Um, scientists don't really know what causes vitiligo. They're still trying to figure that out. But in the meantime, camouflage and laser and UV therapy is what they have um, on the market for dermatologists to use to treat vitiligo. Now, I spoke before about keloids. So this is a, uh, a male with keloids. And um, for some of you fraternity people who may get branded, let's say you decide to you know, cut into your keloid again, it gets bigger. You decide to cut into your keloid again, it gets bigger. Your cells are just continuously reproducing over and over and over again. And it can actually get to that point. Um, so for persons who deal with um, keloids, um, again, laser therapy. Um, there's probably some surgical incisions that uh, dermatologists can use, um, but the keloids will come back. Um, there's also steroids that are used to treat this. And so um, you wanna be really careful if you do have keloidal skin, try your best not to cut into it. A lot of African-American women, we love to style our hair. And so um, what we'll do is we'll get the pomades, especially oil-based pomades, and put it on our hair. And some of the oil seeps down into our forehead, which basically creates that pomade acne. So one of the things that I tell a lot of African-American women to do is to use a gel-based um, moisturizer, a hair moisturizer, or be careful about you know, putting your hands on your forehead or making sure that it doesn't pass your hairline when you're applying um, pomades to your hair. Here's another um, male with acne, and we deal with acne um, just, you know, 
uh, based on hormonal issues, puberty, and so that acne can actually produce hyperpigmentation, which I'll show you in a later <laughs> slide. So I'm sure you guys, is, are any chemistry majors in here? Great, okay. So here are some of the chemicals that are used to actually treat acne. You may have already seen some of these in the lab. Glycolic acid. Glycolic acid actually comes from sugar cane, salicylic acid. Any of y'all take Tylenol? That's the active ingredient in that. In that. So they'll take salicylic acid, um, which is plant-derived as well, and um, benzoic acid. Anybody use proactive before? Proactive, the active ingredient in that product is benzoic acid. So as you can see, a lot of these things that you see in your chemistry classes you can see how these things are created, incorporated into products to treat certain ailments. Um, retinoids, anybody use Retin-A before? Okay, Retin-A is just basically vitamin A. Um, you can get it over the counter as a retinol, which is a much lower concentration, or you can get um, it in um, diff another form, which is prescription grade that you'll find a dermatologist uh, will prescribe for you. So, for persons who have acne or any cuts or wounds, um, they experience, for the most part, hyperpigmentation. Basically, hyperpigmentation is the overproduction of melanin. So, in that one specific area where you may have experienced an acne lesion, you'll see as your acne lesion starts to heal, you'll see a dark mark appear. And depending on how deep that acne lesion was, if it was cystic, it's gone really deep into the dermis, then that will let you know how you know, deep your hyperpigmentation is. The deeper into the dermis, the much longer it would take for you to actually you know, even out that um, area to match your skin tone. So hyperpigmentation looks different amongst all the populations. So for the African-American woman, it looks different from the Latino woman that is dealing with melasma. Remember I told you it was almost like a veil on their face, splotches of um, dark patches. And then for the Asian male, it looks a lot different. So for all persons of color, the, ex the exhibit of hyperpigmentation varies. So that's why it's so important for estheticians and dermatologists and cosmetic scientists to be able to see the differences in each group because that determines how you're gonna deliver your um, active ingredient in your product. So for this Asian male, he has a very aggressive acne um, condition which is causing his hyperpigmentation. So the first course of action would be to treat his acne first. So what could he treat with his acne? What um, active ingredients could he treat, use? Good, what else? Okay. So as his skin um, begins to heal, then you would uh, you start using a product that would treat the hyperpigmentation. So for some persons of color, they have no idea how to deal with the hyperpigmentation. And for a lot of us women, we feel, you know, uh, a little self-conscious about the dark spots on our face, so we'll cover it up with makeup, not knowing that it only exacerbates the condition. So it only makes the condition a lot worse. So now more and more you're seeing cosmetic companies create these makeup products that can actually even out the skin tone. Has anybody heard of BB cream? You've seen those commercials, CC cream. So a lot of those creams will contain retinol, vitamin C, licorice extract, a lot of the ingredients that can treat the acne and the hyperpigmentation. So you can put on a full face of makeup and your foundation can work for you. So whenever, I showed you the reaction of melanogenesis before. So whenever you're dealing with 
a um, product that treats hyperpigmentation. This second reaction, this is what it occurs. Basically, this basic reaction, you're trying to stop it from moving towards creating more melanin. And so when you're using uh, bleaching creams such as hydroquinone, when you're using um, licorice extract as an active ingredient, when you're using a retinol or retin-A, that's exactly what it's doing. So I talked about the usage of hydroquinone. Hydroquinone is one of the common ingredients that is used for hyperpigmentation. And um, it's used a lot in other countries, in other continents, such as Africa and the Middle East and Asia. And those countries is not heavily regulated. And so you'll see, you know, the common standard in the United States is to use a 2% hydroquinone um, cream type product. Um, that you could find at Walmart or Eckerd's, I'm sorry, not Eckerd's, but CVS. And, but for co other countries, they use a much higher percentage. You can see it at 10% or more. And it bleaches the heck out of their skin. This woman right here, this is her before, and this is her after. She's a very famous South African uh, singer. There's a lot of implications to that. As a cosmetic chemist, I have to look at that holistically when I'm formulating because not only do I look at, you know, the chemical side, but I have to look at the influences from culture, um, from belief systems. And so that allows me to gain ideas on how to create products. Now, this woman in particular, she wanted to go lighter because she felt like she'll get more opportunities as an artist if she had lighter skin. And that's a lot of the mindsets of um, people in um, those uh, countries. They feel like if they go lighter, then they'll get more opportunities. In India, it's a caste system. You have women commercials where they show a grade of darkness to light and um, you use that um, grid to see how light you can get with the bleaching cream. And that basically opens the door for opportunities for marriage into a very wealthy family or uh, to get a better job. So the usage of those high, um, those, uh, those products with hydroquinone with uh, high concentrations, this is the damage that can happen and it's irreversible damage. And so now countries are starting to regu uh, regulate it and banning the usage of hydroquinone. I mean, of course, some of it is still being sold over the black market. Um, I believe the US FDA is actually considering banning the usage of hydroquinone. So now you have more and more estheticians, dermatologists, and consumers that are looking for alternatives to the usage of this um, active ingredient. So here are some more natural ingredients that can be used to effectively treat hyperpigmentation and um, give you that even skin tone without damaging your skin. So remember before I talked about Retin-A, which is vitamin A, then you have your glycolic acid. Um, for persons who have hyperpigmentation that's gone deep into their dermis, and you'll know that because it's, it's take, you'll know when you, it's deep into your dermis because it's taken a very long time to actually see results from using your product. So it takes about eight weeks to start seeing results. If you've used the product for more than eight weeks, let's say, you know, 20 weeks or so, it's probably time for you to go to the dermatologist or the esthetician to probably give you something that's a little bit stronger. And that may include, you know, doing a chemical peel. Chemical peels, you can use glycolic acid and salicylic acid to actually peel the layers of your skin. And that's done over a course of time. So you'll go in for, you know, you'll have a course of several treatments first treatment, they'll give you a low concentration of glycolic acid, let's say 20%, um, and it'll peel your epidermis. And then maybe a week or two later, you come back in and it peels away. And they keep peeling and peeling and peeling until you have that even skin tone. So here are some common ingredients 
that you'll see cosmetic chemists use for skin of color. Shea butter, everybody knows what shea butter is, right? It's commonly found in um, West and East Africa. There's two different types of um, chemical makeups for um, shea butter in those regions. Then you have baobab oil, which a lot of people don't know much about yet um, here in the U.S., but it's a moisturizing oil that a lot of African um, women use to moisturize their skin. Then you have, like I said before, glycolic acid, which, is, which comes from sugar cane. And then your mango butters and your jojoba oil. Jojoba oil actually mimics the sebum that you release from your skin and your scalp. So that's a great um, moisturizer for your scalp and your skin. So, the, like I said before, I draw from so many different areas. And as a scientist, you can't just, you know, confine yourself to the four walls. You have to draw inspiration from outside the lab. That means hanging out and communicating with people that may not look like you, talk like you. They may be in a different major. Um, they, may be, they may not be from the same city you are. Um, reading books outside of, you know, what your professors provide you. That's how you draw innovation. That's how you draw inspiration. So I told you I, I formulate holistically. So not only do I look at, you know, the chemical ingredients to treat certain conditions, but I also look at the implications culturally when it comes to certain you know, cultural skin and hair practices. There's certain practices that Native Americans um, practice to treat their certain um, skin conditions that I can draw from when it comes to me formulating. Same with African women, same with Filipino women. There's certain practices that they have that as a chemist you can look at and say, well, huh, they're using this particular butter or they're using this um, neem oil to treat um, this bacteria um, condition, maybe that's something that I can use to create a product. Then I also take into account the structural and functional differences of all the skin types. So everyone knows who this guy is, right? Steve Jobs. How many of y'all have an iPhone? Okay, well this is the guy that created it. When you look at this guy, this guy is probably one of the most innovative persons that um, you could ever imagine to have been walked the earth, probably. Um, this guy, he drew from several different sources to create what you all have in your pockets, the iPhone, the MacBook, the iPad. All of those things came from the fact that he drew inspiration from different cultures. He took time to really understand the customer and the person that he's serving. And the reason why I put his picture up is because as scientists, as I said before, tend to just confine themselves to the four walls. And confining yourself to the four, four walls does not breed innovation. So if you wanna be someone that's innovative, to be able to develop an, uh, a product or an idea that is going to serve other people is going to require you to get out of the lab. For Steve Jobs, he took a calligraphy class and that's why you have the unique fonts with um, the Apple computers. Basic, you know, thing that he did was mix himself with other people. Now for scientists, we have to, you know, you have to mingle with business people because a lot of scientists are not necessarily business minded. So if you have an interest in starting a business as a scientist, then you want to mi mingle with the business student. You want to mingle with the, um, the entrepreneur in your community. Collaborating with peers, sharing ideas. Everyone has a different viewpoint. And don't be afraid to share your ideas because that's where you draw upon, you know, bringing more innovation into this world. Mentorship, you all have great professors here. Grab them, have them to mentor you. My professor mentored me and that's why I was able to develop my own company. He taught me everything that he knew about cosmetic science. And so that's so important when you wanna, you know, 
push your career forward. It's so important to have great mentors around you to sponsor you, to uh, be able to encourage you and also correct you when you're wrong. Also attending industry conferences for U.S. students. I'm sure you have the American Chemical Society. You may have a biology student society, a pre-med society. Start attending those conferences because you get to meet other people. You get to go to workshops that are that have great you know, ideas to be expressed from experts. You get to learn that cultivates learning. And so you want to be able to um, have um, ideas that will last, you know, for time and memoriam. And so the great way to do that is to attend conferences and mingle with people who are thinking the same way as far as innovation. Um, do your research. Don't just do what your professors tell you that you should be doing. Do extra. Go beyond what is given to you in the classroom. So, for instance, I was talking to a class early t earlier today, and I think it was a biology lab, and she had um, equations on the board. And I said, you know, do you realize that this is something that you can practically apply to your life? You know, using sodium chloride, it's important that you know the percentages. You know, um, for instance, you know, a lot of people don't think cooking is a science. It is a science. When you're, you're mixing all the spices and all of that, you got to be able to know that those things gel together. Um, when you're working in the medical field, you know, you got to be able to understand percentages of using certain ingredients like sodium chloride and when you're treating a patient because that understanding of how to um, add those numbers, put those percentages together, it will be the determinant factor as to whether your patient lives or dies. So for me, working in the lab um, is, my, is a haven, a place of creativity for me. And so one of the first things that I do when I'm creating a product is I go into the lab and I pray because as a woman of faith, I believe that God gives me divine inspiration on how to create products and how to put them together. And so I pray and then I think about, well, what are the common problems that I'm hearing from um, men and women of color um, lately? And so number one issue is uh, post-inflammatory hyperpigmentation. So I think about the ingredients that I could use to treat that. So I write a list down and I think about the different pathways that these ingredients take to actually treat this disorder. And then I think, come up with a vision for my product. Do I wanna create a serum? Do I wanna create a soap? Do I wanna create a cream? What is the best delivery system for this product to treat hyperpigmentation? So for instance, I say, well, I'm gonna create a serum because it, um, it'll deliver a lot quicker than a cream. And so I create a serum. So I think about, okay, what is gonna go into this serum? I have these active ingredients. What are the percentages? So I look at, I do a lot of reading to find out, you know, what are the standard percentages that are used? And then I also look at, okay, well, what fillers do I want in the product? Any of you guys know what emulsion is? Emulsion is basically taking the water, taking water and oil, mixing it together with a filler or a binder to make it one. So when you're looking at, let's say a cream, it's an emulsion. Um, when you're looking at a serum, it's an emulsion because you gotta be able to bring the two together to combine, to create that product. And so I look at those percentages and then I come up with the formula. And so I'll say, okay, I need 20% shea butter. Um, how much of a binder will I need to actually bind the shea butter with the water? And so each um, ingredient that I use has a factor that basically, emulsifying factor that basically tells me, well, you'll need, you know, I can calculate, you need this much shea butter to be able to um, emulsify it with this amount of water. So I'll take 20% shea butter, 80% water, or let's say 20% shea butter, 70% water, and then 10% of a binder to bring, it, bring the two together to make it into a cream. 
And so I look at those things and it's very important to, you know, know your numbers, be able to, you know, um, make sure that the numbers are correct because you could be creating a product that may um, have an active ingredient like glycolic acid. And if your concentration and the percentage isn't right, when your customer uses that product, it could possibly burn their skin. So you wanna make, sh you wanna make sure as a cosmetic chemist that you understand your numbers, you understand the formulas and that everything adds up. So from that, I continue to develop the product, formulate it, then I'll make, do about 20, no, not 20, maybe about 10 different versions of that product. And the process that it takes me to uh, make that, um, the different versions is what I'll do is I'll try the product myself. And if it doesn't give me a good slip, meaning if it doesn't rub on smoothly, then I will just um, probably decrease you, uh, the amount of binder that's in the product. Um, if it's too greasy, then I'll decrease the amount of oils that I have in the product. Um, I'll have other people try out the products as well. So someone may say, well, I don't like the fragrance. I hate the scent. Great, you know, um, moisturizer, but the, you know, the scent stinks. So I'll have to go back, reformulate that. And I have to think about, well, what type of scents am I going to use? Because some scents can color the product. So let's say if I used um, an amber scent, which has a brown color to it, it can make the product brown depending on the percentage that I use. So I want to make sure that I use a, um, a fragrance that maintains the color that I want for the product. So all of these things I take into um, account. And then once I have the final product, then I think about packaging. So for the serum that's treating hyperpigmentation, I may not want to use a plastic um, type of packaging because the active ingredient in my serum is UV sensitive. And so if the light hits it, it can actually activate that particular active ingredient. And that active ingredient wouldn't be of use to the person that um, needs it to treat their skin disorder. So I would put it in a glass amber bottle and then the next thing I need to figure out is, okay, am I gonna use a dropper? Am I gonna use a pump? Am I just gonna you know, have a top where someone can just pour it out? Well, you always have to think about the business side. You want your customer to get the best use out of the product. And so I would say, okay, I'm gonna use a dropper because it allows them to measure the amount of serum that they're gonna use, or I'll have them use a, uh, I'll use a pump instead of just you know, a regular top where they'll pour it out. And so from there, you know, I have to think about the labeling, FDA regulations again. Um, they don't highly regulate cosmetics, but, you know, if I'm using certain ingredients, they want me to want to make sure that I list all of the ingredients. If it's an active ingredient that's UV sensitive, I need to list that and also state that the consumer must use a sunscreen. So when you're treating hyperpigmentation, there's really no... Um, reason to use a serum or a product that treats that if you're not going to use a sunscreen afterwards because it will actually reverse the reaction of the um, of the product and so you want to make sure that you know you you wear a sunscreen after you use a product that treats hyperpigmentation because it protects your skin from going darker in those um, spotted areas and so packaging labeling um, then I got to think about marketing at the same time. Who am I going to market this to? Um, well, I have to think about the women that have come up to me um, a lot lately about hyperpigmentation. I look at, well, I've had women who are 25 to 50 who say that they're dealing with this. They're African-American and they're Hispanic. Well, I have to make sure that um, my marketing materials, my website, um, how I um, market um, the products in my messaging, how that all translates to both of those markets. I have to make it unique to each one. So that's basically the process that I go through. And then I have to think about, well, am I going to sell this online? Am I going to sell it um, in stores for retail? Am I going to sell it to dermatologists, estheticians? As a business person and a scientist, I have to think about, you know, the science and the business. And I got to be able to, you know, make sure that 
I'm making a profit and at the same time serving my customer. And at the same time, I'm also thinking about money because money is always a big issue as an entrepreneur. You want to make sure that you're budgeting right for your um, your projects, which for me is, you know, the products that I create. And so um, what I do is basically, you know, sit down, budget what I'm going to do for this particular project. And that's that dictates what type of ingredients that I use um, for a particular product. And if I need more funding, I do so, you know, things like this, compete in business plan competitions to help continue fund my research. There's also other opportunities with SBIR grants. Um, and then also there's venture capital. And then you have your angel investors. All of those things play into building a company as a scientist. So I'm going to give you guys a bit of a reading list. <laughs> and remember I said that you all have to read outside of the, you know, your science textbooks. Um, for one reason, we use a lot of our, you know, our left brain, but, you know, we need to use our right, right brain as well to develop that creativity. So these are the books that I recommend. Blue Ocean Strategy, which will be, you know, great for those scientists that are trying to come up with new ideas in the laboratory. Then you have How to Think Like Leonardo da Vinci. And then another one, Marketing for Scientists. Great book for those scientists that are trying to figure out how to market themselves for jobs. Um, the Startup Owner's Manual, that's commonly used amongst um, scientists, engineers in Silicon Valley. And it basically takes you through the process on developing your idea and really making sure that this is something that your customer wants. And then for inspiration, African Americans that have contributed to science and technology, because you always want to look back at those who've gone before you to see what they've accomplished, because it encourages you to move forward. So in my span of time, you know, doing things um, with my company, a lot of doors have opened for me because I was willing to take the time to learn. I was willing to take the time to move into a passion that was not um, common um, for most persons who go into science. So uh, more recently, yet last year, I was um, named to the World Economic Forum as a young global leader. And next month, I'll be going to Harvard to do their um, global leadership um, program. And basically, it's, they're taking 72 of the top world leaders um, uh, from around the world and training them um, and developing them to become um, world leaders for the future. Girl Scouts, I believe in giving back as an entrepreneur. So I worked with the Girl Scouts for a national campaign to encourage more young woman, women to pursue STEM careers. So they came and did a documentary on my work um, as a cosmetic chemist. So when you start walking in your passion, when you start walking in your path as a scientist, doors will start to start to open for you. But you have to be willing to develop yourself outside of what you're doing in your classroom and outside of what you're doing in the lab. So last thing I want to say is that you can do it. Be confident in yourself. There's no reason why I shouldn't see the next Pfizer, the next Eli Lilly come out of this room. There should be no reason why I shouldn't see um, the next Bill Gates come out of this room. Each of you have potential. You have great professors here that are willing to nurture you. You have a great university here that wants to nurture you, but you have to be willing to do the work. And don't f beat yourself up if you fail, because there will, will be failures, but you know, Believe in yourself and know that you can overcome those failures and learn from them and move forward. And I will close out with this. Any questions? Thank you for having me. Any questions? So she's asking, um, she's noticed that in, um, in cosmetology, a lot of the products are not um, targeted towards um, the ethnic market of persons of color. And she wants to know why um, that um, is happening. And I can tell you for one reason, they don't, one, they don't view us as a viable market. Um, even though we have such a lar large spending power, to them, it doesn't mean anything. 
And then the other thing is they feel like their products are one size fits all, which is not true. Just because this product that you have in the mainstream, you know, works for your Caucasian population doesn't necessarily mean that it works in African American um, or skin of color pop populations. And um, I would like to say that even when it comes to testing these, these products, there's probably a, they probably don't even test it on our market. It's probably just Caucasians that they test it on. Roadblocks, um, she wants to know if I have any roadblocks. Um, I would say that, no, not really. Um, because every person that I have spoken to about my company, whenever I go out and speak, they all say the same thing, that this is needed. Because when you look at um, the Procter and Gamble's, the Eli Lilly's, you know, and a lot of those pharmaceutical companies, they don't really do um, research on ethnic markets because our body reacts differently to certain drugs. One drug that may be used predominantly for Caucasians to treat like mental illness can be used for African-Americans to treat a heart condition. But you won't know that if you know you didn't try it on that market. And then the, also there's also a fear amongst um, African-Americans and other persons of color that they may be mistreated during clinical trials. So it's a twofold thing. Um, but for me, I have not experienced any setbacks when it comes to um, talking about my company and what I'm trying to accomplish. Any questions? I know somebody. Okay, go ahead. I guess, um, I don't know if I missed it or not, but fresh out of undergrad, you got your BS. Mm hmm. Yeah. Like, were you just prompted to just start a business or? I started it while I was in school. Okay, so you were in undergrad. Yeah. Mm hmm. <coughs> what were your first steps to do that? Um, I got books on how to start a business, and then I took some free classes from the Small Business Development Center. Every um, city has a small business development center that ha offers classes that teach you how to start your own company, how to write a business plan. Anyone that's interested in doing that while you're in school, it's very doable. Um, there's a book called Campus CEO, which basically teaches students how to start their own companies. I know of a young man that went, that goes to Duke right now, and I think he's a sophomore, he started his own company while he was in high school. This guy is donating money to, to Duke while he's a sophomore in school. So it's, it's possible. Um, and I think it, it, this is the best time to start a business while you're in school, while there's resources from the university that you can use. This is the best time to do it. You see, um, Facebook started while he was at Harvard. Why couldn't you start the next Eli Lilly right here at Albany? There's nothing stopping you but yourself, you know? It's my store in Tallahassee. And I don't have a retail store. I sell my products online. I have a laboratory in Tallahassee. Did I do this all by myself? Um, I would like to say I did a large percentage by myself. It, it took a lot of legwork because no one's gonna move on your vision like you want it except for you. When you start getting the wheels rolling, then people start coming around to help you. And so I got the wheels moving and then people came around or opportunities came around to help me. Thank you so much for having me.